page 57 chapter 6 poets and pancakes about the author asoka mitrin 1931 a tamil writer recounts his years at gemini studios in his book my years with boss which talks of the influence of movies on every aspect of life in india the Gemini Studios, located in Chennai, was set up in 1940. It was one of the most influential film-producing organizations of India in the early days of Indian filmmaking. Its founder was S. S. Vasan. The duty of Asoka Mitran in Gemini Studios was to cut out newspaper clippings on a wide variety of subjects and store them in files. Many of these had to be written out by hand. Although he performed an insignificant function, he was the most well-informed of all the members of the Gemini family. The following is an excerpt from his book, My Years with Boss. Notice these words and expressions in the text. Infer their meaning from the context. Blew over. Catapulted into. Played into their hands, heard a bell ring, was struck dumb, a coat of mail, the favourite haunt. Heard a bell ringing. Pancake was the brand name of the makeup material that Gemini Studios bought in truckloads. Greta Gabo must have used it. Miss Gohar must have used it. Vijayanti Mala must also have used it. But Rati Agnihotri may not have even heard of it. The makeup department of the Gemini Studios was in the upstairs of a building that was believed to have been Robert Clive's stables. A dozen other buildings in the city are said to have been his residence. Page 58 for his brief life and an even briefer stay in Madras, Robert Clive seems to have done a lot of moving, besides fighting some impossible battles in remote corners of India and marrying a maiden in St. Mary's Church in Fort St. George in Madras. The makeup room had the look of a hair-cutting salon with lights at all angles around half a dozen large mirrors. They were all incandescent lights, so you can imagine the fiery misery of those subjected to makeup. The makeup department was first headed by a Bengali who became too big for a studio and left. He was succeeded by a Maharashtrian who was assisted by Dharwar Kannadiga and Andhra, a Madras Indian Christian, an Anglo-Burmese and the usual local Tamils. All this shows that there was a great deal of national integration long before AIR and Doordarshan began broadcasting programs on national integration. This gang of nationally integrated makeup men could turn any decent looking person into a hideous crimson hued monster with the help of truckloads of pancake and a number of other locally made potions and lotions. Those were the days of mainly indoor shooting and only 5% of the film was shot outdoors. I suppose the sets and studio lights needed the girls and boys to be made to look ugly in order to look presentable in the movie. A strict hierarchy was maintained in the makeup department. The chief makeup man made the chief actors and actresses ugly. His senior assistant, the second hero and heroine. The junior assistant, the main comedian, and so forth. The players who played the crowd were the responsibility of the office boy. Even the makeup department of the Gemini studio had an office boy. On the days when there was a crowd shooting, you could see him mixing his paint in a giant vessel and slapping it on the crowd players. The idea was to close every pore on the surface of the face in the process of applying makeup. He wasn't exactly a boy. He was in his early 40s, having entered the studios years ago in the hope of becoming a star actor or a top screenwriter, director 
or lyrics writer. He was a bit of a poet. Page fifty nine. Page fifty nine. In those days, I worked in a cubicle, two whole sides of which were French windows. I didn't know at that time they were called French windows. Seeing me sitting at my desk, tearing up newspapers day in and day out, most people thought I was doing next to nothing. It is likely that the boss thought likewise too. So anyone who felt I should be given some occupation would barge into my cubicle and deliver an extended lecture. The boy in the makeup department had decided I should be enlightened on how great literary talent was being allowed to go waste in a department fit only for barbers and perverts. Soon I was praying for crowd shooting all the time. Nothing short of it could have saved me from his epics. In all instances of frustration, you will also find the anger directed towards a single person, openly or covertly, and this man of the makeup department was convinced that all his woes, ignominy, and neglect were due to Kota Mangalam Subbu. Subbu was the number two at Gemini Studios. He couldn't have had a more encouraging opening in films than our grown-up makeup boy had. On the contrary, he must have had to face more uncertain and difficult times. For when he began his career, there were no firmly established film-producing companies or studios. Even in the matter of education, especially formal education, Subbu couldn't have had an appreciable lead over our boy. But by virtue of being born a Brahmin. A virtue indeed. He must have had exposure to more affluent situations and even people. Page sixty. He had the ability to look cheerful at all times, even after having had a hand in a flop film. He always had to work for somebody. He could never do things on his own. But his sense of loyalty made him identify himself with his principle completely, and turn his entire creativity to his principle's advantage. He was tailor-made for films. He was a man who could be inspired when commanded. The rat fights the tigress under water and kills her, but takes pity on the cubs and tends them lovingly. I don't know how to do the scene. The producer would say, and Subbu would come out with four ways of the rat pouring affection on its victim's offspring. Good, but I am not sure it is effective enough. The producer would say, and in a minute, Subbu would come out with fourteen more alternatives. Filmmaking must have been and was so easy with a man like Subbu around. And if ever there was a man who gave direction and definition to Gemini Studios during its golden years. It was Subbu. Subbu had a separate identity as a poet, and though he was certainly capable of more complex and higher forms, he deliberately chose to address his poetry to the masses. His success in films overshadowed and dwarfed his literary achievements, or so his critics felt. He composed several truly original story poems in folk refrain and diction, and also wrote a sprawling novel, Thilana Mohanambal, with dozens of very deftly etched characters. He quite successfully recreated the mood and manner of the Devadasis of the early twentieth century. He was an amazing actor. He never aspired to lead roles. But whatever subsidiary role he played in any of the films, he performed better than the supposed main players. He had a genuine love for anyone he came across, and his house was a permanent residence for dozens of near and far relations and acquaintances. It seemed against Subbu's nature to be even conscious that he was feeding and supporting so many of them. Such a charitable and improvident man, and yet he had enemies. Was it because he seemed so close and intimate with the boss, or was it his general demeanor that resembled a psychophant's, or his readiness to say nice things about everything? In any case, there was this man in the makeup department who would wish the direst things for Subbu. You saw Subbu always with the boss. In any case, 
there was this man in the makeup department who would wish the direst things for Subu. Page 61 You saw Subu always with the boss, but in the attendance roles. He was grouped under a department called the Story Department, comprising a lawyer and an assembly of writers and poets. The lawyer was also officially known as the legal advisor, but everybody referred to him as opposite. An extremely talented actress who was also extremely temperamental once blew over the sets. While everyone stood stunned, the lawyer quietly switched on the recording equipment. When the actress paused for breath, the lawyer said to her, One minute please, and played back the recording. There was nothing incriminating or unmentionably foul about the actress's tirade against the producer. But when she heard her voice again through the sound equipment, she was struck dumb. A girl from the countryside, she hadn't gone through all the stages of worldly experience that generally precede a position of importance and sophistication that she had found herself catapulted into. She never quite recovered from the terror she felt that day. That was the end of a brief and brilliant acting career. The legal advisor who was also a member of the story department, had unwittingly brought about that sad end. While every other member of the department wore a kind of uniform, Khadi Dhoti with a slightly oversized and clumsily tailored white Khadi shirt, the legal advisor wore pants and a tie and sometimes a coat that looked like a coat of mail. Often, he looked alone and helpless. A man of cold logic in a crowd of dreamers. A neutral man in an assembly of Gandhiites and Khadiites. Like so many of those who were close to the boss, he was allowed to produce a film and though, uh, and though a lot of raw stock and pancake were used on it, not much came of the film. Page 62 Think as you read. 1. Why was the office boy frustrated? Who did he show his anger on? 2. Who was Subbu's principal? 3. Subbu is described as a many-sided genius. List 4 of his special abilities. 4. Why was the legal advisor referred to as the opposite by others? 5. What made the lawyer stand out from the others at Gemini Studios? Page 62 Then one day, the boss closed down the story department and this was perhaps the only instance in all human history where a lawyer lost his job because the poets were asked to go home. Gemini Studios was the favourite haunt of poets like S.D.S. Yogiyar, Sangu Subramaniam, Krishna Sastri and Harindranath Chattopadhyay. It had an excellent mess, which supplied good coffee at all times of the day and for most part of the night. Those were the days when Congress rule meant prohibition and meeting over a cup of coffee was rather satisfying entertainment. Barring the office boys and a couple of clerks, everybody else at the studios radiated leisure, a prerequisite for poetry. Most of them woke Hadi and worshipped Gandhiji. But beyond that, they had not the faintest appreciation for political thought of any kind. Naturally, they were all averse to the term communism. A communist was a godless man. He had no filial or conjugal love. He had no compunction about killing his own parents or his children. He was always out to cause and spread unrest and violence among innocent and ignorant people. Such notions which prevailed everywhere else in South India at that time also, naturally, floated about vaguely among the Khadi-clad poets of Gemini Studios. Evidence of it was soon forthcoming. When Frank Buckman's Moral Rearmament Army, some 200 strong, visited Madras sometime in 1952, they could not have found a warmer host in India than the Gemini Studios. Someone called the group an international circus. They weren't very good on the trapeze and their acquaintance with animals was only at the dinner table. But they presented two plays in a most professional manner. Their Jotham Valley 
and The Forgotten Factor ran several shows in Madras and along with other citizens of the city, the Gemini family of 600 saw the plays over and over again. The message of the plays were usually plain and simple homilies. But the sets and costumes were first rate. Madras and the Tamil drama community were terribly impressed and for some years, almost all Tamil plays had a scene of sunrise and sunset in the manner of Jotham Valley with a bare stage, a white background, curtain and a tune played on the flute. Page 63 it was some years later that I learned that the MRA was a kind of counter-movement to international communism and the big bosses of Madras, like Mr. Wasson, simply played into their hands. I'm not sure, however, that this was indeed the case, for the unchangeable aspects of these big bosses and the enterprises remained the same. MRA or no MRA? International communism or no international communism? The staff of Gemini Studios had a nice time hosting 200 people of all hues and sizes of at least 20 nationalities. It was such a change from the usual collection of crowd players waiting to be slapped with thick layers of makeup by the office boy in the makeup department. A few months later, the telephone lines of the big bosses of Madras buzzed and once again, we at Gemini Studios cleared a whole shooting stage to welcome another visitor. All they said was that he was a poet from England. The only poets from England the simple Gemini staff knew or heard of were Wordsworth and Tennyson. The more literate ones knew of Keats, Shelley and Byron and one or two might have faintly come to know of someone by the name Elliot. Who was the poet visiting the Gemini Studios now? He is not a poet. He is an editor. That's why the boss is giving him a big reception. Vasan was also the editor of the popular Tamil weekly, Ananda Vikatan. He wasn't the editor of any of the known names of the British publications in Madras that is, those known at the Gemini Studios. Since the top men of the Hindu were taking the initiative, the surmise was the poet was the editor of a daily, but not from the Manchester Garden or the London Times. That was all that even the most well-informed among us knew. At last, around four in the afternoon, the poet or the editor arrived. He was a tall man, very English, very serious and of course very unknown to all of us. Battling with half and a dozen pedestal fans on the shooting stage, the boss read. The boss read out a long speech. Page 64 It was obvious that he too knew precious little about the poet or the editor. The speech was all in the most general terms but here and there, it was peppered with words like freedom and democracy. Then the poet spoke. He couldn't have addressed a more dazed and silent audience. No one knew what he was talking about and his accent defeated any attempt to understand what he was saying. The whole thing lasted about an hour. Then the poet left and we all dispersed in utter bafflement. What were... What are we doing? What is an English boy doing in a film studio which makes Tamil films for the simplest sort of people? People whose lives least afforded them the possibility of cultivating a taste for English poetry. The poet looked pretty baffled too, for he too must have felt the sheer incongruity of his talk about the thrills and travails of an English poet. His visit remained an unexplained mystery. The great prose writers of the world may not admit it, but my conviction grows stronger day after day that prose writing is not and cannot be the true pursuit of a genius. It is for the patient, persistent, persevering drudge with a heart so shrunken that nothing can break it. Rejection slips don't mean a thing to him. He at once sets about making a fresh copy of the long prose piece and sends it on to another editor enclosing postage for the return of the manuscript. 
It was for such people that Hindu had published a tiny announcement in an insignificant corner of an unimportant page. A short story contest organized by a British periodical by the name The Encounter. Of course, The Encounter wasn't a known commodity among the Gemini literati. I wanted to get an idea of the periodical before I spent a considerable sum in postage sending a manuscript to England. Think as you read. 1. Did the people at Gemini Studios have any particular political affiliations? 2. Why was the Moral Rearmament Army welcomed at the studios? 3. Name one example to show that Gemini Studios was influenced by the plays staged by MRA. 4. Who was the boss of Gemini Studios? 5. What caused the lack of communication between the Englishman and the people at Gemini Studios? 6. Why is the Englishman's visit referred to as unexplained mystery? Page 65 In those days, the British Council Library had an entrance with no long winded signboards and notices to make you feel you were sneaking into a forbidden area. And there were copies of The Encounter lying about in various degrees of freshness, almost untouched by readers. When I read the editor's name, I heard a bell ringing in my shrunken heart. It was the poet who had visited the Gemini Studios. I felt like I had found a long-lost brother and I sang as I sealed the envelope and wrote out his address. I felt that he too would be singing the same song at the same time. Long-lost brothers of Indian films discover each other by singing the same song in the first reel and in the final reel of the film. Stephen Spender, Stephen, that was his name. And years later, when I was out of Gemini Studios and I had much time but not much money, Anything at a reduced price attracted my attention. On the footpath in front of the Madras Mount Road post office, there was a pile of brand new books for 50 paise each. Actually, they were copies of the same book, an elegant paperback of American origin. Special low-priced students edition in connection with the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. I paid 50 paise and picked up a copy of the book, The God That Failed. Six eminent men of letters in six separate essays described their journeys into communism and their disillusioned return. Andre Gide, Andre Geit, Andre Jait, Richard Wright, Ignacio Ceylon, Ignacio Ceylon, Arthur Kosler. Arthur Kostler, Louis Fisher, Louis Fisher, and Stephen Spender. Stephen Spender. Suddenly, the book assumed tremendous significance. Page 66. Stephen Spender, the poet who had visited Gemini Studios. In a moment, I felt a dark chamber of my mind lit up by a hazy illumination. The reaction to Stephen Spender at Gemini Studios was no longer a mystery. The boss of the Gemini Studios may not have much to do with Spender's poetry, but not with his God that failed. Understanding the Text Understanding the Text 1. The author has used gentle humour to point out human foibles, Pick out instances of this to show how this serves to make the piece interesting. 2. Why was Kotamangalam Subu considered number 2 in Gemini Studios? 3. How does the author describe the incongruity of an English poet addressing the audience at Gemini Studios? 4. What do you understand about the author's literary inclinations from the account? Talking about the text. Discuss in small groups, taking off from points in the texts. 1. Film production today has come a long way from the early days of the Gemini Studios. 2. Poetry and films. 3. Humour and 
criticism. Noticing transition. This piece is an example of a chatty, rambling style. One thought leads to another, which is then dwelt upon at length. Read the text again and mark the traditions from one idea to another. The first one is indicated below. Makeup department, office boy, Subu. Writing. You must have met some interesting characters in your neighborhood or among your relatives. Write a humorous piece about their idiosyncrasies. Try to adopt the author's rambling style if you can. Page 67. Things to do. Collect about 20 cartoons from newspapers and magazines in any language to discuss how important people or events have been satirized. Comment on the interplay of the words and the pictures used. About the unit. Theme. An account of the events and personalities in a film company in the early days of Indian cinema. Subtheme. Poets and Writers in a Film Company Environment Comprehension Understanding Humour and Satire Following a rambling, chatty style and making inferences Talking about the text Discuss Today's film technology compared with that of the early days of Indian cinema Comparing and Contrasting Poetry and Films Criticism and Humour Noticing transitions. Focus on devices for achieving thematic coherence. Writing. Practice writing in the humorous style. Practice writing in the humorous style. Things to do. Extension activity on cartoons as a vehicle of satirical. satirical. Repeat. Extension activity on cartoons as a vehicle of satirical comment on human foibles.